on World News Tonight. The debate. Biden and Putin go against each other with dueling messages. Tonight, more on the state of the brewing nuclear war. Visiting allies. Amidst the controversial messages, China's top diplomat is in Moscow ahead of a Ukraine war anniversary. Coast to coast storm. Winter alerts in 26 states in the United States from California to Maine. Americans now brace themselves for a hard winter. Belgian festivities. With ostrich feathers and flying oranges, Belgian carnival returns after Covid. This is Ada Verna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and you're joining us on World News. And we're reporting tonight on the diplomatic discrepancies between the three main world powers, the Russian Federation, the United States and China. President Joe Biden's trip to mark the anniversary of the war in Ukraine highlighted an even more grave challenge, a new era of simultaneous and sometimes intertwined U.S. confrontations with nuclear rivals Russia and China. Joe Biden, who was on the world stage in Poland, offered a blistering condemnation of Putin directly taunting the Russian president for underestimating the resolve of NATO to stand with Ukraine in its war with Russia. Russian president, on the other hand, has said that he is suspending his country's participation in the 2010 New START nuclear arms reduction treaty with the United States, imperiling the last remaining pact that regulates the world's two largest nuclear arsenals. Fresh from his wartime visit to Kyiv, U.S. President Joe Biden rallied NATO allies in Poland on Tuesday, reaffirming unwavering support for Ukraine and committing to bolster the alliance's eastern flank against Russia. One year ago, the world was bracing for the fall of Kyiv. Well, I've just come from a visit to Kyiv, and I can report Kyiv stands strong. Biden's speech at Warsaw's Royal Castle comes as the war enters its second year, with no end in sight. Hours earlier, Russian President Vladimir Putin vowed that Moscow would achieve its objectives in Ukraine, accused the West of plotting to destroy Russia, and said Russia was suspending participation in the 2010 New START Treaty, its last major arms control treaty with Washington. While Biden said every inch of NATO territory would be defended if it was attacked, he disputed Putin's assessment that the West is a threat to Russia. The United States and the nations of Europe do not seek to control or destroy Russia. The West was not plotting to attack Russia, as Putin said today. And millions of Russian citizens who only want to live in peace with their neighbors are not the enemy. This war is never a necessity. It's a tragedy. Biden spoke after meeting NATO ally and Polish President Andrzej Duda, a vocal proponent of stronger Western support for Kyiv. That followed Biden's unannounced trip to Ukraine on Monday, the first time in recent memory a U.S. president traveled to a war zone not controlled by U.S. troops. Earlier on Tuesday, at least one Russian rocket slammed into a busy street in the southern Ukrainian city of Kherson, killing six people leaving a pool of blood on the pavement beside a mangled bus stop. <laughs> Moscow has denied deliberately targeting civilians, but cities across Ukraine have been devastated in missile and drone attacks, and thousands of civilians have been killed. Biden condemned the attacks and said the world would not look away from atrocities committed by Russia. A dictator bent on rebuilding an empire will never be able to ease the people's love of liberty. Brutality will never grind down the will of the free. And Ukraine, Ukraine will never be a victory for Russia. Never. Now, amidst these tensions, China's top diplomat Wang Yi said that he expects to reach a new consensus on advancing bilateral relations with Russia as he visited Moscow just days before the first anniversary of the Kremlin's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Putin welcomed China's top diplomat Wang Yi to the Kremlin, telling him that bilateral trade was better than expected and could soon reach a $200 billion a year, up from $185 billion in 2022. 
Wang Yi told Putin that relations between the two countries had withstood the pressure from a volatile international situation and that crisis offered certain opportunities. The relationship between China and Russia, Wang Yi said through the interpreter, was not directed against any third party but equally would not succumb to pressure from third parties, a clear jab at the United States. Chinese weapons supplies to Russia would threaten a potential escalation of Ukraine war into a confrontation between Russia and China on the one side and Ukraine and the US-led NATO military alliance on the other. Wang Yi later met Russia's foreign minister Sergei Lavrov, saying that he looked forward for clinching new agreements during the visit to Moscow. When Xi Jinping met Putin face-to-face -face just before Russia sent troops into Ukraine, they sealed a no-limits partnership that triggered anxiety in the West. For Putin, China's big power support amid the biggest confrontation with the West since the height of the Cold War allows him to cast Russia's isolation in the West as a tilt towards Asia. For Xi Jinping, Russia is now more dependent on China than ever. Once the leader in the global communist hierarchy, Russia after the 1991 collapse of the Soviet Union, is now a junior partner to a resurgent China which already leads in many 21st century technologies. China has released its Global Security Initiative concept paper which focuses on preventing conflicts and promoting global security while blasting the use of sanctions in foreign policy. The initiative, which was unveiled by the foreign ministry, hinges on several core concepts and principles meant to help both China and the international community navigate in what the document describes as an era rife with challenges. It prioritizes UN-centered security governance, stating that the Cold War mentality, unilateralism, block confrontation and hegemonism contradict the spirit of the UN Charter and must be resisted and rejected. Countries should also uphold the consensus that a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. The initiative reads, adding that the nuclear powers should strengthen dialogue and the cooperation to mitigate the risk of nuclear standoff. The document went on to stress the need to take the legitimate security concerns of all countries seriously while respecting their sovereignty and territorial integrity. Addressing the conflict between Moscow and Kyiv, the paper highlighted the need to support political settlement of hotspot issues such as the Ukraine crisis through dialogue and negotiation. Chinese Foreign Minister Ching Gang said the initiative strives to establish a human community with a shared future and that it is open and inclusive for any nation to join. The idea of the initiative was first put forward by Chinese President Xi Jinping in April 2022 as a means to hold up the principle of invisible security in the world. This comes one day after China releases a report titled U.S. Hegemony and its Perils, blasting Washington for escalating the great power competition across the globe, staging color revolutions and stoking regional tensions under the guise of prompting democracy. China said it was troubled by Japan's military buildup and Tokyo took aim at Beijing's military ties to Russia and its suspected use of spy balloons in the Asian power's first formal security talks in four years. The talks aimed at easing tensions between the world's second and third largest economies came as Tokyo worries that Beijing will resort to force to take control of Taiwan in the wake of Russia's attack on Ukraine, sparking a conflict that could embroil Japan and disrupt global trade. Japan in December said it would double defence spending over the next five years to 2% of gross domestic product, a total of $320 billion to deter China from resorting to military action. Beijing, which increased defence spending by 7.1% last year, spends more than four times as much as Japan on its forces. Tokyo plans to acquire longer-range missiles that could strike mainland China and to stock up on other munitions it would need to sustain a conflict alongside the large US forces it holds. Leaving Japan's foreign ministry, after the meeting, Chinese Foreign Minister Sang Wengdong said that they had also discussed Japan's release of wastewater from the devastated Fukushima nuclear plant into the Pacific and about unblocking industrial supply chains. Following the downing of a suspected Chinese spy balloon by the United States, Japan last week said that it planned to clarify military engagement rules to allow its jets fighting to shoot down unmanned aircraft that violate its airspace. In a statement after the meeting, Japan's foreign ministry said that it had also stressed the importance of peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. The two countries had agreed to try and establish a direct communication hotline around spring and to strengthen dialogue between their senior security officials. Now, while the world is concerned over the brewing nuclear war, South Korea has decided to ease more travel restrictions on China. Starting March, travelers from China are no longer required to take PCR tests upon arrival. 
South Korea is further easing travel rules for travelers from China. The Central Disaster and Safety Countermeasures Headquarters announced on Wednesday that from March 1st, travelers from mainland China will no longer have to get PCR tests upon arrival. They've been required to get tested within a day of entering the country since January 2nd after Beijing's decision to end zero COVID policies and an uptick in infections in China. Also from next month, flights departing from China heading to South Korea will be allowed to land at other airports. Flights from China will continue to arrive at Incheon International Airport only until the end of February. The decision was made on the back of the improved virus situation both at home and abroad. South Korea's daily COVID-19 tally last week averaged around 11,599, down 14.4 percent from the week before. The number of critically ill patients has dropped to around 100 for the first time in seven months. The percentage of travelers from China who've tested positive declined to 0.6 percent last week from 18.4 percent in the first week of January. The latest new changes mean there will be only two remaining measures for visitors coming from China. Proof of a negative COVID-19 test taken before departure and travelers must provide their contact information to the quarantine information pre-entry system through the Q-Code app for effective tracking and tracing. These restrictions were also set to expire on February 28th, but health authorities pushed back the date to March 10th. Whether or not these rules are scrapped will depend on the virus situation then. Seoul has been lifting its virus protocols on Beijing one by one. On February 11th, the government decided to resume the issuance of short-term visas for Chinese nationals. Last Friday, it announced that the number of inbound flights from China would increase from the current 62 per week to 80 by the end of this month, rising to 100 per week from March. We're going into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back to World News tonight. A major and disruptive winter storm could go down in history books in parts of the United States as it impacts millions of people with heavy snow, blizzard conditions and significant icing. This coast-to-coast -coast winter storm could be amongst the top snowstorms to ever strike Minneapolis with the Twin Cities potentially seeing up to two feet of snow by the time the massive storm system exits the region. Tonight, the National Weather Service is warning that a historic winter storm is on the move, already starting to pummel Minnesota with what could be up to two feet of snow over the next three days. The governor issuing emergency executive orders to prepare the National Guard. We don't uh, overreact, but we also understand that weather can be dangerous, so we take it seriously. The winter wallop slogging across the country from Washington State in Idaho to North Dakota, where there was chaos on I-29, icy, treacherous roads, snarling semis. While in Colorado and Wyoming, whiteout conditions. Even in the Twin Cities, a region used to wicked weather, this snowfall could be one of the top five largest in history. The last time Minneapolis saw this much snow was in 2010, when the roof of the Metrodome collapsed. Now the rush is on to prepare for this latest winter blast. Travel coast to coast could be impacted for the rest of the week. A key border crossing between Pakistan and Afghanistan remained closed for a third day, with thousands of goods vehicles stuck and businesses facing losses as officials from both sides try to broker a solution. Taliban authorities closed Tokum, the main point of transit for travelers and goods between Pakistan and locked Afghanistan. The Pakistan-Afghanistan Joint Chamber of Commerce and Industry said that the closure of the border crossing between Pakistan and Afghanistan was causing losses to traders in the two countries. Up to 6,000 trucks loaded with goods had been stuck on both sides since Sunday. The reason for the closure was not entirely clear, though officials on both sides have said that they were in discussions to resolve the issue. The provincial Taliban official said Pakistan had not lived up to its commitments to allow transit, travelers and sick people seeking treatment to cross. Pakistan's government had not commented publicly on the matter yet. A Pakistani official source said that they had not been told the reason ahead of the closure. 
Traders, particularly those supplying fresh food items such as fruits and vegetables, said that they were facing losses as trucks are stranded on the way for the past three days. Residents had reported heavy gunfire near the Tokum border crossing, but the Taliban official had denied any clashes and said the situation was under control. Disputes linked to the 2,600-kilometer border have been a bone of contention between the neighbors for decades. The Philippines and Australia discuss pursuing joint patrols in the South China Sea days after the Southeast Asian country held similar talks with the United States to counter China's growing assertiveness in the disputed waterway. Australian Defence Minister Richard Miles met with his Philippine counterpart Kalito Galvez in Manila, something they said that they plan to do yearly in a bid to deepen the country's security ties. With overlapping sovereign claims in the strategic waterway, the Philippines is ramping up its attempts to counter what it describes as China's aggressive activities in the South China Sea, which has also become a flashpoint for Chinese and U.S. tensions around naval operation. The possibility of the Philippines and the Australia holding joint patrols comes on the heels of similar discussions between Manila and Washington about conducting joint Coast Guard patrols, including the South China Sea. Military ties between Australia and the Philippines date back to 1922 and the two nations have an existing status of visiting forces agreement that provides a comprehensive legal and operational framework for defence cooperation. Ahead of his meeting with Miles, Galvez had a call with US Defence Secretary Lloyd Austin where they discussed the decision to resume their country's combined maritime activities in the South China Sea, according to a Pentagon statement released yesterday. The statement said that the two talked about concerning developments in the South China Sea, including the February 6 incident in which China's Coast Guard directed a military-grade laser at the crew of the Philippine Coast Guard vessel lawfully operating around 2nd Thomas Shoal. China has said that the Philippines' account did not reflect the truth that its actions were illegal. Over in the United Kingdom, nurses in England will pause planned strike action to enter intensive talks with the British government on pay and conditions in the first sign of a break in the long-running dispute. Britain is experiencing its largest wave of strike action in decades, involving hundreds of thousands of workers from a range of professionals and piling pressure on Prime Minister Rishi Sunak to settle the disputes, many of which involve the public sector. Separately, the government said it had also invited teaching unions to move into formal talks on pay conditions and reform on conditions to the upcoming strikes were cancelled. Commenting on the letter from the government offering talks to the union, the National Education Union's Joint General Secretary Kevin Courtney said that there was nothing in it that suggested that should call off the strikes, adding that they could change the decision when their national executive meets on Saturday. We have some good news for you. There has been another medical breakthrough. A third person has been cured of HIV thanks to the bone marrow stem cell transplant. The French Pasteur Institute announced that the patient was probably cured as more than five years after he received the transplant from a donor with a rare genetic mutation that resists HIV infection and 44 months after he came off antiretroviral drug tests showed no trace of the man's previous infection. The unnamed man living with HIV received the bone marrow stem cells as part of a treatment he was undergoing against leukemia in Dusseldorf. With a previous case in 2007, dubbed the Berlin case, and another 2016, the London patient and the Dusseldorf patient comes as the third case of HIV cure by bone marrow transplant worldwide. Though the procedure is complex, expensive and risky, scientists say that it is a positive step in the search for a cure to HIV, with one potential solution being the introduction of the HIV-resistant gene mutation in patients without resorting to bone marrow transplants. More than 38 million people worldwide are currently infected with HIV and the AIDS pandemic has killed about 40 million people since it began in 1980. Medical advances over the past three decades have led to the development of drug combinations known as antiretroviral therapies that can keep the virus in check, allowing many HIV-positive people to live with the virus for years. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. According to statistics, Korea recorded 249,000 births and 372,800 last year, 
translating a natural population decline of 123,800. This is the third in the row that the natural population, which excludes immigration or immigration, has fallen. New satellite imagery shows that North Korea may be involved in ship-to-ship -ship transfers in its west coast. Planet Lab's Voice of America claimed two more ships were added to the lineup of vessels seen the day prior. European Space Agency is set to peer into the dark universe with a new space telescope. The spacecraft is called Euclid. Euclid will travel to its destination 1.5 million kilometers from Earth to help scientists further stack dark matter, dark energy and gravity. Genario Garcia Luna, a former law enforcement official once in charge of Mexico's fight against drug traffickers, was convicted on U.S. charges that he took millions of dollars in bribes from the Sinaloa cartel. Bird flu has killed tens of thousands of birds, mostly pelicans, and at least 716 sea lions in protected areas across Peru, as the H5N1 strain spreads throughout the region. Peru recorded its first case of the virus in November in birds in the north of the country. According to a government data source, it has killed 63,000 birds since then. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always re-watch by visiting our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And finally, we leave you tonight with a round of thousand performers clad in traditional costumes featuring white wax masks and hats adorning with huge ostrich feathers parading to the sound of drums in Belgium's most famous carnival. Thank you for watching, stay safe and have a good night.